the artist me came first, the business me came second. I really had to work very hard on that to really find my way. And now I feel very strong at that, but, and I'm back to like leading with the artist me. Um, so it feels good. I, I'm leading with the artist me, but charging properly for it. Hi, Carrie. How are you? Hi, Nikki. I'm so good today. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, thanks for being here with me and for doing video. This is oh, totally. Whenever I can. Actually, I'm the photographer that wants to be on camera. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's awesome. That's awesome. Okay, Carrie. So let's just give me a brief overview of where you're at and what you shoot for the most part. Okay. All right. So I've been shooting professionally for 17 years. Oh, wow. And um, right now I focus primarily on boudoir, beauty, and personal branding. So like kind of triple B, boudoir, beauty, branding. Yeah. Um, but I've done a lot of different things in my career. I kind of started out trying to shoot like fashion in New York City. And then I moved back to Connecticut. And then I shot weddings for eight or nine years. And then I decided to make the switch to full-time portrait about five or six years ago. And just really kind of honing in on the genres that really light me up. Yeah. Um, so that's that's kind of where we're at now. That was like the briefest I've ever described that journey. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I definitely want to hear more about it. But one thing one thing I've, I heard recently is that you have a really high portrait sales average right now, something like over 5,000. Is that right? Mm-hmm. That yeah. Is it was incredible. Uh, I calculated it the other day. I had my studio manager. I was like, I'm going to be talking to Nikki and I really need to know some of my numbers here. So I was like, let's crunch the last three months. And my portrait average currently is at $5,930. Oh my God. Almost 6,000. Mm -hmm. That's incredible. Has it always been that yeah. high? No, <laughs> this was a journey, of course. Um, and it all like the venture into professional portrait pricing really did happen after I discovered Sue okay. and the whole doing like the whole self value work and all of that. And of course, along with that is working on your money story and delving into all of these truths or untruths that we tell ourselves and that are buried in our subconscious. So we can get to the point where we're actually knowing our value inside and out and asking for the money in, what Sue says is in equal exchange. Totally. Um, I mean, I think the first time, <laughs> the first time I ever made over a thousand dollars on one portrait shoot was I sold 10 portraits in a leather folio box for $1,200. And I was like, oh my God, they just paid me $1,200. Like I was freaking out. Totally. <laughs> Isn't it funny? I remember the same for the first time I did it. I was like, oh. <gasps> Like I almost felt bad and I like gave her way more photos than what originally came in, in the package. I was like, okay, well, you can just have them all. <laughs> like, I know. Well, we do that, right? We, we're just like, we feel like everybody wants the kitchen sink or needs it. And they're just usually just looking for what they paid for. <laughs> but we don't know this until after we've established like, okay, I really know the value of this. Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. So yeah. I, I know you said that you photographed weddings. And I'm wondering, mm -hmm. actually, just go back to to how you started. How did all of this start for you? And how did you build your way up? Well, start with how you started, and then we'll get to the how you built your way up. Okay. So it's kind of a process of elimination story. <laughs> I was never the kid growing up who knew exactly what I wanted to be. So I ended up going to college three times to figure it out and moving to New York City in my 20s to just like really try to find myself. Um I'm fairly risk averse. So I I mean, when I moved to New York when I was 25, I was just like, peace out, Connecticut. I'm out of here. Like I had no money. I had no plan. I just knew that like I got into FIT, uh, the Fashion Institute, Institute of Technology. Um, and originally I had gotten it for jewelry design because I thought I wanted to be a jewelry designer. Oh, cool. So yeah. um, the first time I went to college, I didn't know at all what I wanted to do. I got my undergrad in business admin and I basically went to college on softball scholarship. I just knew that I was an athlete and that I wanted to play ball and that I would figure it out. Um, I took a photography class then. And then when I was taking jewelry design, I took a photography class. And both of those professors were like, hmm, you have a really good eye. I think maybe you should consider this. And I was always like, man, whatever, I'm busy. Um, yeah. Until 
I woke up one day and I had the epiphany. I was like, I'm already doing photo shoots. I already love this. Like I was just doing it because I loved it. And then I realized like, maybe this is what I want to do. So then I decided to enroll in photography classes at that point because I wanted to fast track the learning on all the technical stuff. Mm -hmm. Um, And the FIT program at the time, and I think it still maybe was rooted very much in film. So I learned on all different film formats. You know, a 35 millimeter, of course, is what we started on. But when I learned about medium format and large format, I was just like, I'm home. Like, this is where I'm supposed to be. Wow. Wow. So at that point, then you said you were 25? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So at that point, that's when you were like, okay, I'm ready to start a business. Well, you know, it's kind of funny. I, I'm the only one in my immediate family who ever really had an entrepreneurial spirit. Mm. I would like in grade school make like yarn bracelets and sell them to my friends for like $2 or whatever, you know, like I was always trying to, (laughs) trying to like do something. And I knew that like the corporate path wasn't for me. I have worked a corporate job like once or twice in my life for like a very brief time and it was not good. But (laughs) I, I knew that I was supposed to be working for myself. I didn't know what that looked like. But when I found photography, I was like, this is, this is what I'm supposed to be doing. Um, but the artist me came first, the business me came second. I really had to work very hard on that to really find my way. And now I feel very strong at that, but, and I'm back to like leading with the artist me. Um, so it feels good. I I'm leading with the artist me, but charging properly for it. Right, right, right. That's such a process to get to. I think so many artists and I mean, even if you're not quote unquote a creator, like I'm technically not a creator. If you look at my profile, it sounds like you are, it sounds like you are a creator, but whether or not you're a creator, the business side of it is like, I just feel like that is the part that trips people up. Charging appropriately, having that self-value to feel okay with what you're charging, Mm -hmm. understanding everything that comes out of, even if you're bringing in $3,000, $5,000, $1,000, most of that is going back out to something Mm -hmm. that we're paying for. And it's the little things that I think people don't add up and the time, the hours spent, if you divide that and see what you're really making hourly on a shoot, it's like... It's so eye opening. So, yeah, I, it's it's interesting to hear you say that, and I I really like the way that you put it, where you were leading before with, you know, the, your the artist was leading, but having no idea how to run a business. But it, you're proof that you can do both. Like you can be a business person and an artist. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, you see the massive spectrum in our industry, and no matter what genre somebody shoots, right? Yeah. Like. I know photographers who shoot every genre who are so talented, but can't make a dime because they don't have the self-value portion worked out. Yep. And then I know some photographers who I look at their work and I'm like, meh, but they're making a killing yeah. because they know they're worth it and they they charge appropriately. So That's kind of how I feel about myself. Meh. I mean, sometimes I'm really good. Most of the time, <laughs> I'm just that, you know, but I can make a killing at it. You know what I mean? It's like... It, it it does. It comes down to and, – and I think too, Carrie, I wonder what you think about this, is like the practice of being a business person. Like the more times that you say how much you charge and the more inquiries you get, the more time you send – the more times you send your pricing, it's almost like practice. And then it becomes easier and easier. And the more the more you do it, it just becomes second nature. And it's just like, well, this is what I charge. Like did you find that that it was practicing? <sighs> Yeah. Also, in addition to having awesome mentors in our industry like Sue and having the support of the, you know, everybody in the SBE and and all of that, I had also invested a lot into personal coaching, like life coaching, business coaching, Mm -hmm. all of that. And that really helped with the work that I was doing on the value piece. One of my coaches had said to me, and she and it's like it's like anything. It, like sometimes you just have to hear the message right. Like you may have heard it a thousand times from a da- thousand different sources, but it's like that one day where it just hits you in yes. the gut, and you're like, "Oh, I get it now." So she had said, and I've post this on occasion, and I have a few times in the Sue Bryce group where it's like they're just numbers. Release mm. your emotional attachment to them. 
say the numbers out loud, like they're just, once you just start to practice saying these numbers coming out of your mouth, they get easier. And once you're working on your money story and knowing that the numbers you're saying are related to money, it gets easier. Um, And then once you look at your numbers and your time and your level of experience and how much is invested in creating the portraits you're creating and breaking that down. You're like, when you look at the numbers like that, you're like, well, I'm actually not even paying myself. Right. Unless they buy something. (laughs) Right. Right. (laughs) So it's like, what is your, you know, and this gets talked about in our community a lot too. Like, what is your time worth away Mm -hmm. from the people who love you. Mm -hmm. And it's like at the end of the day, at the end of any of our days, nobody's on their deathbed like, oh, I wish I worked some more. (laughs) Yeah, totally. (laughs) Totally. I love what you said too about the numbers being not attaching the numbers and the money to an emotion. So like, Mm -hmm. you know, my purse at Target might have cost $20 and I'm not like... I wonder if Target feels bad about charging me $20. Like, should I feel, you know what I mean? It's it's like, it's just, this is what I cost. And it doesn't need to be tied to any sort of guilt or shame. And, and you know, in the, I don't know if you watch the Money Wheel of Misfortune, but Sue and Tiffany really break that down and how we don't need to attach the money to emotion. And, and it just makes such a difference. I really like the way that you put that. Like, Okay, so my Canon that I'm recording on right now was, I think when I bought it new, was $3,300. That's mm-hmm. just a number. I paid for it. Just like someone who paid you you know, $5,000 is like, well, here's mm-hmm. $5,000 for my photos. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I really like looking at it that way. Okay, so- I like, I like can I say something else on please, that? Please, yeah. Um, I also like removing the words expensive- Mm. Or like, you know, expensive or not expensive, like from the vocabulary, it's like, is it valuable to you? Then whatever the value is of that thing, like you're going to pay for it. Like the iPhone, like nobody wants to pay $1,200 for a phone, but we all do it because we value it. Like it's it's just the thing that is attached to that. And sometimes people get a little cringy when they're like, okay, here's my card. I didn't want to spend $7,000 or I didn't want to spend $3,000 or $2,000 or whatever the number is, but then they do and they're thrilled when they get their pictures. Right, so it's like right. they value it. So they, they do pay for it. Yeah. Um, yeah. So yeah. that's, that's, I just try to remove that. Yeah. Word. Yeah. I really love that. I love that a lot. It's, it's such a great way to just kind of reframe it. Mm-hmm. I'm wondering, reframe. so you said you, you did weddings for eight years. Oh, did you, yes. <laughs> were you making like just as much money doing that? Was it something you enjoyed doing? Like at what point, like, tell me about your whole wedding, just briefly about your wedding experience and what made you decide portraits? was where you're so (laughs) I lived in New York City for five years and I had actually you know my first studio was in the Dumbo section of Brooklyn Uh, it's like right on the water it stands for the down under the Manhattan Bridge overpass and it's really beautiful like movies are filmed there the whole thing cobblestone streets I created uh an art co-op it, like it, with some other photographers and painters and blah 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 to share this uh rented studio space and um and I was like, yeah, this is going to be where it all happens. Like I'm photographing models and all this stuff. And then New York, like I had a lot of really rich times in New York. And then I had a lot of really super broke times where I was mm-hmm. eating ramen and barely able to pay my rent times. Um, and New York kind of ate me alive at the end there. And, and I didn't want to come back to Connecticut, but it was time. And it mm-hmm. felt, it did feel right at the time to come back to Connecticut. But I had said, I'll never move back to Connecticut and become a wedding photographer. <laughs> But that's exactly what happened. And I ended up interning with uh, a pretty well-known, um, there, like a couple that did weddings at the time. Um, so I could get my foot in the door because I listened to the they. They said, you'll never make money in photography in Connecticut unless you shoot weddings. Yep. And I said, okay, I guess that's what I'm going to do. Um, I had no idea what I was doing. <laughs> of course, we all just kind of go and do and figure it out. Oh, yeah. Um, there was, I felt like a lot of the work I was showing because blogs were like really big at the time and all that, like 
I, it was like really mediocre and I was hiding the really creative stuff because I was like, oh, people don't want to see that. Mm-hmm. They want to see mm-hmm. like, oh, the setup and that setup and blah, blah, blah. And I was like, oh, I'm so bored. And then once I started to show my creative stuff, that's when like people really started loving it. And I was like, oh, now I'm just really proud of this portfolio. I am glad that I had the experience of shooting weddings. I know how to shoot film. I know how to shoot digital. I know how to shoot in any kind of found light. I can use on mm-hmm. the on-camera flash. I can use strobe. Like I, I, I feel like it made me really strong in that because for weddings, you have to be able to shoot still life. You have to be able to shoot photojournalism. You have to be able to shoot portraits mm-hmm. and pose moments um, and work with all different kinds of light throughout the entire day yep. and have the stamina to do it all. <laughs> yep. Yep. Oh, so, so hard. <laughs> And so I developed a really strong skill set in that, um, and I'm really glad to have that, have had that experience. But and I, my identity as a professional photographer was tied so strongly for so long to being a wedding photographer that I really had to have this like kind of slow like detaching. Yeah. yeah. Um, but then once I, once I kind of decided. I was like, no, I'm Carrie, the portrait photographer. Like, this is what I do. Yeah, yeah. Um, it was kind of like a relearning again, like, okay, so let me dive in and figure out how to sell this. And what what do I want to shoot? Like, how do I pose people? Like, I always had a good instinct for that, but I had to study it. And now I feel like I'm a master at that. Like, it's um, so it was kind of like this baby steps, but I, I the weddings, it God bless wedding photographers everywhere. <laughs> Agreed. Agreed. <laughs> you used to shoot weddings too. You know, it's yeah. so, it's like a hundred hours of work per event. It's just so much. Yeah. And it's communication with a client for like a year and a half before you yeah. photograph anything. And it's like, totally. oh, it's just a yeah, lot. I want to go back to what you said about how they said you can only make money, at, you know, in this industry as a wedding photographer, because I think a lot of people still believe that. Mm. And it's one of those things where, it, like you like you said, 100 hours of, of time goes into a wedding sometimes. I can mm-hmm. do a portrait, portrait. I do personal, 90% personal branding now. I can do mm-hmm. like two or three, depending on which package they buy, and make the same amount that I was making at a wedding, but work like a tenth of the amount of time that I worked on mm-hmm. it. So... It's one of those things where I'll take doing two or three personal branding shoots over a wedding any day. I think really what it is, I mean, I guess it depends on how many weddings you need to book or whatever, but it's almost like as long as you just increase the amount of people you're shooting or clients you're finding, although with your average, I mean, I would think that you, you know, you'd probably be pretty equal to what you were making with a wedding. What do you think? Well, when I was shooting weddings, I, I let people bargain me down all the time. Like I was not, I hadn't done the value work at that point. Um, and there were a couple seasons where I shot like 15 weddings. And I know for some photographers, that's like, Oh, you only shot that. It's like, Oh my God, I felt like I was dying at the end of it so much. Same, Carrie. Same. (laughs) Um, but yeah, I mean, I, my, the weddings that I was shooting, I was probably ranging a three to 5,000. Okay. So um, you can do one shoot mm-hmm. and make the same. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So I, I can think of multiple weddings where, I mean, this is once I was already a few years in where I was making like 3,500, 3,600. And I mm-hmm. pretty much make that. I mean, I can think of shoots that I made that and more in one shoot and then I think yeah. about too, as a school social worker, my paycheck was $3,300 $3, per month. So I can make mm. what I made in a month as a social worker in one shoot. And I think it's just, I'm, and the reason I want to talk about this is I think it's so important for people to shift from thinking they can't make money to, you know, like if you're out there watching this or listening to this, if you think you cannot make a good average with portraits because everyone down the street or in your town or whomever is only charging $400. Like, that's not true. You can. I'm an example. Carrie's an example. Basically, everyone who I've interviewed on this podcast is an example. So that's why I just kind of like to get into that nitty gritty sometimes because I think sometimes people are just stuck on that. And we've all been there. I remember thinking the same thing. You were thinking the same thing. Mm -hmm. There's no shame in it. It's just time to, like, get over it, move forward, and learn about the business side of it and, and start doing it. 
And that's all anchored into what we were taught and what we think we believe in uh, all of these kind of outside forces. It's mm-hmm. like when we learn to start to work through that stuff and to raise our self-awareness and to put some blinders on so we stop doing the comparison game. Yep. It's like I like – I'm in this old mill building right now. I think there's like three other photographers in my building. I don't care. Yeah. I don't care what they're doing. Like, I mean, whatever. Like, they're probably nice people. It's fine. But like, as far as business goes, I really, I don't care. Yeah. Like, I'm pro- I'm definitely probably the one that's priced the highest and, and that's been working fine for me. Yep. Like, so. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. So speaking of pricing, let's talk through, I want to, I want to talk in a minute about how you marketed and how you did the transition from weddings into portraits and boudoir. But before we do that, let's talk a little bit about your pricing and how, how you structure okay. that. There was a lot that changed over the pandemic last year. Um, I'm, I'm based in Connecticut. We were shut down for four months. So when that happened, I couldn't do any client facing activities, but my business was still going. I still had to pay rent. Mm-hmm. I was still was doing social media. I decided to get really busy on the back end of my business. And that included um, raising my prices a bit because I, after looking at everything, I was like, you know, I think I was charging five fifty last year for my session fee, Mm -hmm. um, at the beginning of last year. And I was like, this isn't, this isn't feeling good because, and then I was also charging an a la carte price. And then my intro package, my lowest package was a, a lower than it is now. And it was just like, when I sold that, it didn't feel good. If I came yeah. in and had a couple of people buy two or three portraits, I'm like, why did I just produce this entire session <laughs> with my 17 years of experience and creativity and all this for somebody to buy a few images when they liked more? You know, so basically in in trying to figure all this out, I was like, okay, I'm gonna raise it to 750. And then I was in a workshop with a lot of very high performing women, like multi six into seven figure earners, um, coaches in all different industries and things. I was the only photographer there. And we're talking about some, we touched on my pricing a little bit. And I think I was saying, oh, I charge 750 and then you buy after blah, blah, blah. And one woman just stopped the room and she was like, I wouldn't even take you seriously unless you were charging four figures to work with you. And other women in the room were like, "Mm mm-hmm. And I was like, oh, shit. (laughs) Interesting. (laughs) That's really interesting. So I was like, well, I know what I've paid for coaching over the years. And I know what I've paid for workshops. And I know what I've paid for online courses. And I'm like, why am I charging such a little amount to work with me when I'm customizing the session? I'm doing a wardrobe consultation. I started working with a stylist. I have professional hair and makeup. We do five looks. Mm -hmm. It's a fully guided shoot. And we do a reveal session. When I was telling people, describing it like that, and and it includes all of that, for 550, people were like, oh my God, that's it? Like I heard that from some clients. (laughs) And so then now when I say, well, it's actually on my contact form now because I was, we can get into that in a minute, but I was... um, spending a lot of time on the phone with people who were, who just couldn't afford it. Mm. And that felt like a bit of a waste of not, not the best use of my time. So um, now they kind of know when we get on the phone, like my creative fee is 1500 and that this is what you get with that. And then, and I actually make them pick on the contact form. What's your level of investment? Yeah. (laughs) Like everybody picks the lowest one, but like some people spend more, some people spend in that range, whatever. Um, But it's, I pour so much into every session and I want my clients who love their portraits to have all of the ones that they want. Yeah. So that yeah. it, there is an investment level for that. So if they can't afford me, sometimes they like with everybody, sometimes they'll come back later or the next year or right. whenever, like when, and they're like, okay, I'm ready. Like I saved for this, let's do it. Um, so it was definitely a process. I mean, for a long time, my session fee was in that like 250 to 500 range. Mm -hmm. Um, And then it just was like, okay, I'm getting them in at a lower thing. I'm kind of going into my pocket for the rest of the cost to put it on. And then I'm hoping that they buy. Like Mm -hmm. it just didn't, it didn't feel good for me anymore to do that. And what you're providing with service level, it's high end. Like you said, wardrobe consultation hair and makeup. What did you say? There were a couple of consultation, the, re- the reveal, like 
it's not just a yep. come and get your shoot and then you're done. You know, so it, 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 you know, if you're out there listening, thinking like, well, I want to increase my session fee. Not that you have to add in all of these things, but but make sure you are giving like service to match it, I guess, would you say? Yes. Yeah, absolutely. A hundred percent. And I, that's that's something that my clients do rave about. They're like, oh my God, your team. Like I mm-hmm. felt so taken care of. Mm-hmm. I felt pampered. I felt like a goddess. I felt seen. Like all of these things that we all want to hear. Um, and it was very it's very satisfying to hear that because it is a high level service. And I'm somebody who does not enjoy having to do all of the things on set when I'm trying to photograph and be creative in, in that way. Like, can I do all the styling? Yes. I can't do hair and makeup. (laughs) Like, so let's just be real with that. But like, I need that person there, but like, you know, I have a, a behind the scenes gal who comes in and does my, um, Instagram stories in real time, on the shoots, nice. like That's awesome. I can't do the social media and do all the things it, it, even after the shoot. I'm like so tired, like I can't. So I'm just like, let me bring in the that people to help so me. Smart. <laughs> it, this is again, everybody has to find the way that works for them. Mm-hmm. I think we all just need to always be checking in with our gut and what feels good. I think a lot of us forget to try to check in there and lead with that, but when you do everything kind of comes into alignment. This is just what works for me right now. Maybe right. this won't work for me next year. I don't know. Yep. Like, you know, I, but it's always kind of being conscious about that and raising your self awareness, becoming a better version of yourself, breaking through whatever blocks that come up. Like, it's always a work in progress. Mm-hmm. Like, and just having the awareness around that. Cause sometimes it's like, well, I was shooting. I, I shoot families for my current clientele, but I don't show it anywhere. Yeah, like, and it's yeah. not that I hate families or children or anything like that. I actually am very good at photographing children, but it's so exhausting energetically for me to yeah. do those kinds of shoots uh, that I just don't advertise it. Yeah. Um, so right. it's like, but I had to have that experience and I had to check in. It's like, well, do I want to market to families or don't I? Like, do I want to market to maternity or don't I? Like, what like, do I want to do multi generations? Do I want to just do branding and headshots? Like, I really had to check in with that. So, you know, like we said, right now I'm at Boudoir Beauty and Branding. That could change, mm-hmm, you know, mm-hmm. uh, but that's just what feels really good for me right now. And I love the Boudoir because it really lets me flex my creativity. I can shoot with all different kinds of crazy light, mm-hmm. harsh light, moody light, gloomy light, a light and airy. I can uh, shoot shoot throughs and I can shoot with blur and I can shoot with really soft focus. And people are buying all these portraits that I'm creating like that. And it's making me feel really good because I'm like, I used to kind of look for outside validation and be like, oh, well, this one's blurry and that was intentional. But now I'm just like, this is my work. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. Um, it's a good place to be. I, yeah, it's it's a long road to like this sort of confidence, and of course, I'm still learning that. Yeah, for sure. Um, for sure. But that's that's something that's where it kind of st- like self value, the confidence, the self awareness, yeah. like wanting to be a better version of yourself. It's all tied together. Yeah, and it's all personal work. That if people want to do it, then like show up and put it put in the work right. to get it done. Like, right. Because it, it is hard. It's not for the faint of heart. And a lot of people will be like, oh, well, I tried that and it didn't work. And it's like, well, fail forward. Mm-hmm. You either you either win or you learn. Like there's no failing. Right. Totally. And I love <laughs> that. You win or you learn. Well, I, and I love what you said because a lot of people will say like, I don't have a, an assistant to do behind the scenes or I don't have time during the shoot to do the stories like you said. And you're like, oh, I know. I'll just raise my session fee a little bit, pay someone to come and do it for me. Like you made it work. You found a way to keep that marketing going and you just paid someone to do it and raise your session (laughs) fee. So I love that. I love that. I love that thinking outside of the box and thinking, how can I make this a better experience for my client as well as make it a great, like expand your marketing, expand everything. I mean, everything that's, it's just, it's so great. I love it now. Okay. So your session fee is the 1500 and then how do, Mm -hmm. what do people purchase? Do you have packages or? Yes. So 
I sell the, I sell folio box. Um, and I also sell albums and I sell wall art. So I just actually, <laughs> at my dear friend, Felicia Reed's urging, <laughs> um, I just dropped my lowest package and raised my lowest package to a 10 because I had a package of eight mm -hmm. uh, portraits for 2200 But it stopped feeling good for me to sell that because they don't get a box of that. I don't do the false bottom. Um, I'm like, if you want the box, you have to at least get package number two. You know what I mean? Yeah, like, yeah. Um, but I want to sell. It's a luxury service. I want to sell a complete product or what in my mind feels like a complete product mm -hmm. to the client. So um, so I, my packages now start at $3,100 for $10 wow. and they go to $4,500. So it's like I do $10 for $3,100. I do $15 for $3,750 and I do $20 for $4,500. And then they can add on $5 for $8.75 once they hit the $20. And they have to be at the top package to get an album because right. we need at least 20 pictures to put in a bound book. Right, right. Um, and albums are mostly for boudoir. Right, um, right. But the box works great for that too. And I've had people get 50 portraits over two boxes. And, you know, then the wall art, the wall art pretty much starts around 1500 And that's like, it could be single pieces and that, you know, it goes to infinity depending on how many walls somebody has right right pieces that they want so if i were to book a shoot with you it i would have to spend at least 4600 to get a package pretty much mm -hmm. yeah yeah are you listening out there people <laughs> <laughs> i was trying to be like sarai <laughs> <laughs> well in felicia no, I was... Reed, re real quick just about felicia i mean she lives in texas you live in yep. connecticut like totally yep. different area i mean it's in Sarai's in Tennessee, and you all have very mm -hmm. high sale, sales averages, different places. I know I'm talking all in the U.S., but we do have some, you know, other people in other countries who have extremely high sales average. It's just, I, I, and what, it goes back to what you said, too, about what is working right now for you. Like, mm -hmm. I, I've said this before, I loathe selling wall art. I don't want to do it. So I don't. Oh, really? I don't like it at all. Okay. There you so go. So I make my money in my digital only packages for my personal branding clients. Mm. And that's how I make my money. You know, everyone does it differently. And whatever works for you is what you should do. Yeah. And, and absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So then as far as marketing goes, how are you getting your clients? And especially back when you were doing weddings, did you use those wedding clients as a way to kind of target you know, potential clients through that? Or how did all that work? A, a little bit. Yeah. I mean, it was um, a lot of Facebook, <laughs> for sure. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's honestly where I still have a really good reach uh, on Facebook. And I have like a private VIP client group or people who are potential clients and, um, and things like that. But Instagram as well, it just depends on the demographic. My dem the demographic I tend to shoot is in about that 30, 35 to like 55, 60 year old range. Yep. Um, so it's like the younger people tend to be on Instagram, a little bit older tend to be on Facebook. Yeah. Um, I cater to both. Um, but so basically, it was like getting the start on Facebook, which, I, you know, we're still always trying to grow and things like that. Yeah. But I also joined some local networking groups that were in person. Um, B and I was huge in my life for about three years. If for people who don't know what that is, it stands for business networking international. It's like a, you meet once a week and it's a one seat per profession kind of, um, referral based, uh, mm -hmm. word of mouth net networking. And that was really great for me building my business. When I decided to go full portrait, I joined a BNI, and that's actually where I learned how to be comfortable speaking in front of a crowd and, on camera, getting mm -hmm. more comfortable on camera and things like that, because there's, you have to get up and speak in front of the group yeah. and talk about your business every single week. So it's practice, you know, in front of your, in uh, like your business peers who are local to you. So, um, so that's kind of how I got the word out. And then once the clientele started spreading, then it was referrals. Um, so that's kind of how, that's kind of how it goes. Still yeah. yeah. Gosh, me. networking groups were a lifesaver for me. I'm not, I know I've said this on this podcast before, but truly, I mean, I busted my ass at networking groups for a solid two years and I still reap the rewards from it. Mm -hmm. And, yep. and I love what you just said too, about how it was practice. It is, it's practice for you to do your pitch. 
it's practice for you to just interact with people and build connections with people, make those relationships mm-hmm. with people, because ultimately that's what you're doing with clients. And oftentimes a lot of these people end up being your clients. It's not even just about them referring you, but they end up turning into your clients a lot of the time. It's about showing a genuine interest in, in mm-hmm. the people that you're talking to and not just going in like being like, oh, I need business. I need business. It's like, no, let me make a connection to find out about these other local businesses. How can I serve them? Who can I introduce them to? How can I help them? Um, and then, you know, obviously when somebody asks you, y- then you have your pitch or how you talk about your business, the words you like to use. Mm-hmm. It's not just about like holding your business card out for people. Exactly. It's- it is such a great way to practice and get that gain that confidence around talking about what you do. I think people really struggle. You know, I know I did until I found my own voice. And and it really is. It's a way to kind of rip the band-aid off and just you're mm-hmm. forced to talk about it because let's let's think about it. Like in everyday life, how often is someone like, "Oh, so what do you do?" Probably next to never. You know, I mean, it's not that often that at the grocery store someone stops you and asks you So when someone does ask you, if you don't have, because eventually someone's going to, or when you get Mm -hmm. inquiries, when when you get someone on the phone and they want to hear about the services and what you're going to do for them, if you have that practice, like you get through those networking groups, it just becomes second nature. Like I could say it with my eyes closed, what I do, what I'm going to do for my clients. And Sue talks about this a lot too, about how when you write your about page or when you're telling people about what you do, don't make it about you. I mean, of course you're talking about what you do, but you're making it Mm -hmm. about them. This is what I can do for you. And that I think is so crucial. And going to these groups, just it it is like you're just being thrown right in and you just have to learn. You just, because you're doing it so often. It's like. Yeah. I mean, I used to be so freaked out about public speaking. (laughs) Like I, when I first joined the BNI, you know, five people ahead of me and I'm like, okay, uh, now there's four. And I was like, start to sweat. Yeah. And then like, like I have to like stand up totally. and say my thing for 30 seconds or 40 foot, however long it was. And then I would sit down and I'm like, I can't remember anything I just said. And I'd be like, did I do okay? <laughs> like People are like, yeah, you sounded great. And I'm like, did I say everything I wanted to say? Did I say my name? Like, I don't remember. Yeah. 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 But that just, that comes with practice now. And that's that's something else I think that's really important that networking taught me is introducing yourself, saying your full name. Mm-hmm. Cuz some people don't do that. They'll just say, "Oh, I'm I'm Carrie, I'm I'm Sam, I'm uh Nikki, I'm wh- whoever." Um without saying like, "I'm Carrie Roseman, I'm Nikki Klosser, you know, yep. like I think really important look somebody in the eye and introduce yourself with your full name yeah, um, yeah. with confidence because that's who you are. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. So Carrie, you mentioned that you have a contact form and I'm curious when someone reaches out, how, what, what's your process from, from getting that initial inquiry? So as you know, and I'm sure this happens to you, it happens to all of us in our industry where people will reach out via DM mm-hmm. um, on whatever social platform you're on. And I kind of have like a, a template to respond to those. And actually my social media gal does this for me too, like on Instagram and things like that. When people are like, Oh, I'd like, I'd like a shoot. I'd like a boudoir shoot. I'd like a branding shoot, whatever in my DMS. And then I'll say, Oh, great. We thank you so much for reaching out. We track all of our inquiries through the website. Mm -hmm. Um, This will help inform me a little bit about what you're looking for. And uh, inform you a little bit about starting prices and, uh, and our process. Um, please, here's the link, fill that out. And that will like, if they get through the forum and then they are informed a little bit about pricing, then I know that it's good to have a phone call. Yeah. Um, yeah. And if they don't, then they're not going to be interested in my process at all. Because on that forum too, it does say like, this is an investment of time. Like we, we do, you know, it's a process. Like, are you willing to invest the time into this process? So, because uh, some people who are like, oh no, I just want a headshot. It's like, well, maybe I'm not your photographer because we do a full session. Right. <laughs> and, like, right. There's a planning and all this stuff. But I mean, I don't just say that, but like people will self select out if it's not quite right for them. And the ones who are just like, no, like I'm in, like, and then they, they would book their call. So, um, 
sometimes I'll reach out personally and be like, oh, hey, are you available on this day for your call at this time? Or sometimes they can like go through and I have like a booking through Acuity where they can like pick a date and time. Um, and yeah, if I don't hear, if they inquire and then I don't, they haven't booked their call, then I'll reach out personally and then we kind of connect. And I have um, a business phone number through Vonage on my cell phone. So I don't give out my personal nice. cell, yeah. but we can also text on that too. So I can reach out to somebody like if they, I respond faster to text personally. I'm on email, of course, as well. But if somebody doesn't respond to the email, sometimes I'll send them a text through the business line. And then they're like, oh, yeah, hey, I meant to blah, blah, blah. And then I can schedule there. So it's it's a little cross-platform, but we'd like to keep it in email and, and on the, the phone yeah. line. So You just said something so important is following up. Like everyone has a to-do list a mile long. And sometimes they're like going through and they're prioritizing what's on their to-do list, which usually has to do with like, you know, feeding their children <laughs> or like, you know, whatever that might look like for them for their to-do list. And sometimes booking the photographer falls down pretty far in that to-do list. But if we can make them top of mind by following up, like, hey, they're not going to be mad. They they inquired, you know, I mean, don't be annoying yeah. and call them every day, but just reach out like, hey, just making sure people will be like, oh, exactly what you just said. Like, oh, yeah, that's right. Okay, I've been meaning to call you. Thank you so much for following up. Let's book it this date or whatever. So I think people assume that silence is a rejection, and it's not. It's not. But if you get, like, no response, like, multiple times well, on end, then, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> then you know, then no response is a response. Yeah, you know? yeah. So, totally. But it, there is fortune in the follow-up um, for sure. But the people who like the people who I'm attracting now, and this is this is a good point to make um, that I worked on last year during the shutdown as well, is I kind of raised the level of my ideal client avatar. And the person that I'm working with now is on a personal growth journey themselves. Uh, so yeah. There's everybody likes photography. Everybody wants to think of themselves as like somebody who's going to look awesome in pictures. So many of us have never had that. Mm -hmm. And so I was getting a lot of people who were definitely interested in what I did, but then were having a hard time seeing their beauty. And that breaks your heart a little bit, you know, it's just like, yeah. so the people that I was like, okay, I've been working on myself for tw the last 20 years, <laughs> like at least, you know, on a personal growth level and trying to up level in every way, personally, professionally, all these things mm -hmm. that I want to work with women. I, of course, I photograph men too, but I market to women. I want to photograph women who are on a journey themselves, either have had that transformation or who are on the cusp of it, who want to see that. So the people who tend to inquire with me are ready. Mm-hmm. Like, and, and I actively put that out there. So um, if you follow me on social media at all, it's, you'll see, like, there's so much about, like, positive and, <laughs> and you can do it and just go for your dreams and, like, uh, you know, all these things that we talk about. But it's, like, do the work. Yeah. Um, show up. Put in the work. Like, you, fail, you fall down, get up. Like, that kind of thing. I, we post a lot of that kind of stuff. And, yeah. and people really respond to that. And then the people who don't self select out. Right, right. Which is okay. You're going to be oh, for totally. some people and some people it's not going to resonate with. And that's okay. Absolutely. I do have one more logistical question just about how you do your reveals, your photo viewings. Do they come back to okay. the studio? Is it um printed digital? Yes. So, and again, I feel like this is just you can sell any way that makes you feel good. Yep. Uh, and I've tried a lot of different ways. Yep. I used to do the fully retouched printed reveal with the reveal wall and that worked awesome. And then I did like a projected digital reveal and that worked awesome. Um, and now I'm doing, oh, I did also like unretouched, like smaller printed proof reveals. Um, what I'm currently doing is a a digital reveal, unretouched. I do make some adjustments in Adobe Camera Raw. Um, I turn some black and white, you know, depending on on what it is. If it's branding, I usually show all color. But um, for boudoir, there's always like a bunch of black and white in there. But I'll, I'll show it on um, my computer 
mm-hmm. back at the studio a few days later. I prefer okay, if I have yeah. somebody who's coming in from out of town, like I have a lot of people fly in to work with me. Um, we will typically do their shoot and reveal in the same day. Makes for a long day, but we'll take a break in between. They go get coffee or lunch or something. I go over everything and get the presentation ready and I sell it through Pro Select. Um, yeah. I am going to go back to a projected reveal, but it's not set up quite yet. So I'm using my desktop, uh, 27 inch Mac, um, with the pro select slideshow and that's the software I use to, to sell in it. I really like it. Yeah. <laughs> it, there is a learning curve to it for real, but like, it's great. Yeah, no, that's great. That's great. And I love that you've kind of like worked through different options to see what works for you. I love that. Yeah. Yeah. That's awesome. Very cool. Well, cause you can sell any of these ways. Um, Mm -hmm. I think it's, I think it's important to try different things to figure out what, what really feels good. Again, check in. Yeah. Yeah. Did you like this? Did you not like it? Do you want to just show 20 portraits at your reveal? Do you want to show 50? Like how, like there's all these things to try out, you know, like how many is too many? How many is not enough? What do I want to sell? What do my packages start at? (laughs) Sure. Sure. And it's going to be a total evolution and that's fine. Yeah. What about, I know okay. someone out there is thinking, how do you get these out-of-town clients? How are you finding the people who are going to come to you? Oh, man. So again, social media and just being connected through mutual, it's kind of like referrals through people that I've worked with who have, like my network, like your network is extended yeah. all over the place. I don't know, for example, like even over the pandemic, I had people flying from Texas, coming from Philadelphia, come, like yeah. I just had clients fly in from Maryland and Minnesota and um, and Kansas <laughs> or Arkansas. Um, yeah, so we, we're just connected through mutual people online mm-hmm. and maybe I met them at a workshop networking. Mm-hmm. So this is where it all happens. It's yep. Making those connections, people being starting following you getting them to be a warm lead by having all the touch points. Yeah, totally. That's what I was hoping you were going to say, honestly, because it's, it's thinking outside of the box, getting out of your comfort zone and not just relying on, you know, hoping that people are going to find your website or that they're going to Google search you. Because I'll be honest, some of the people who are likely going to, that they're going to spend five to $6,000 are not finding you through Google. They're just not. They're finding you through their friends of friends. It's it's word of mouth. It's not SEO. And I'm generalizing. I don't know if that that's always the case, but I can think about my kind of more higher end clients who spent more, or even my non higher end clients. But people, it it usually came from a referral. So yeah, a hundred percent, absolutely. Uh, somebody who's been watching who maybe has never commented on my stuff. So maybe I don't even know them yet, but right. they've been watching yep. and they're like, oh, you photographed this friend of mine and I love her portraits or, oh, the third time you photographed it, this friend of mine, then I was ready. Yep. Like, so totally. they, they're, they're watching and paying attention. But the other thing is that the photos don't just sell themselves 99% of the time. It's the messaging you're putting behind it, mm-hmm. the, how you're portraying, like if you're telling the client's story or if you're just making a point about anything to go with your experience, it's a meaningful quote. It's, you know, there's so many different ways to market yourself on social media, but it's about conveying your authentic voice. And that's what people are buying. Yep. You're, yep. You're exactly right. Oh, that's so important. I'm like, rewind that and listen to it again. <laughs> <laughs> Awesome. Yay, a good a golden nugget. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much for sharing everything with us and um yeah, it's it's really good to talk to you. I like I said I've seen you on, you know, just in the group a lot, but um you know, I'd never really like we'd never really had a one-on-one conversation like this deep obviously. So I'm 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 really excited for you and I'm happy to hear your story and it's really inspiring for I'm sure a lot of people are going to be very inspired. So thank you. Thank you so much. I think it's um, really important for us to share our stories as well. Uh, When I moved back from New York to Connecticut all those years ago, and I was starting into wedding photography, everyone was so buttoned up and closed mouth Mm. about pricing and how they got clients. Like nobody wanted to talk about it because there was this like scarcity mentality. And I'm like, there's a lot of us and there's even more people to serve. Like, yeah. wh- why won't people talk about how they price their product or, or services? So it was so refreshing to 
make like friends with people in SBE and, and to have that network. And I mean, I'm friends with people from the portrait master, the first conference, mm-hmm. you know, and like, and just people that I met, like Felicia, I met in the group, like, and now we just call each other every other day, like, Hey girl, what's up? You know, like it's, yeah, it's oh, been it's so very great. amazing. I love our yeah. community. It's so amazing. <laughs> our, the community is so good. Yeah. yeah. Oh, that's great. I'm so happy to hear that. Very cool. Oh, I do have a yeah. couple other questions to ask you that I always ask at the end of each episode. Okay. So the first one is, is what is something you cannot live without when you're doing a photo shoot? There's a few things. The first thing that pops into my head is my, sp- <laughs> I always call it the spider belt, but it's the spider holster. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Same. <laughs> um, <laughs> like as a physical thing. And then the other thing is probably just which is probably actually the most important thing is my energy, Mm -hmm. like the energy in the room, Mm -hmm. everybody being like really good and up and because people can feel that as soon as they walk in. Um, So that's, that's the thing, just getting the energy up. And I actually do kind of sometimes like sing at my clients, which is kind of terrible because I am not a singer, (laughs) but it makes everybody laugh and relaxed and like that sort of thing, or just like saying ridiculous things to get people to loosen up. So there's an element of that. I'm not the silent photographer. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. <laughs> we have music, we have a crew, like I'm loud and boisterous. And, you know, sometimes that's, I, I, I read the room though. If I have a client who's a little bit right. more introverted that I'm not like, Hey, blah. Like, yeah, yeah, totally. I'll rein it in a little bit, but, yeah. um, but yeah, I think that energy is yeah. probably the most so, important thing. So important. They can, like you said, they can feel it right away. Totally. Mm -hmm. I love that. Okay. Number two is how do you spend your time when you're not working? How do I spend my time when I'm not working? Um, Well, in non-pandemic times, (laughs) I'm pretty social. Like I like to go out and eat a meal out or or meet up with friends and things. And that stuff is all coming back. Thank goodness. Um, I do like to cook, so uh, I like to do some of that. And then I'm really into plants lately. <laughs> like I'm, I, we have a nice. lot of greenery around my house, and me and my fiance just bought um, a house in October. So oh, it's congrats. like we've been working on the yard and things like that. Thank you. So those are the kind of the things that take up my my personal time. Yeah, that's exciting. Awesome. Yeah. Okay, uh, number three is what is your favorite inspirational quote? So I love this quote by Edgar Allan Poe. It's, they who dream by day are more cognizant of things which escape those who dream only by night. Ooh, that's really thought provoking. Yes. (laughs) So, I mean, the element beyond that is to like, not just dream it, but be in action towards it. But so there's like a caveat after that, but it's, it's just to remind people like, dream with your eyes open, Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. like go after it, anything that's possible. It really, really is Mm -hmm. like you are the only one who's hindering your success or, or any of your progress. Like once people kind of get around that, then they can see that. So I'm always, um, hopeful of people's potential Mm. and, and wanting to bring that out. Um, but again, it's like a self-value thing. Like they have to see it themselves and know that and go for it. So Totally. So that's my favorite quote. Yep. Yep. Awesome. I love that. Okay. And number four is what would you tell people who are just getting started in this whole photography journey? What would I tell people who are just getting started? I would just tell people to just do it. Like Nike totally got it right, <laughs> right? Like it's just be in motion, be in action. You can't take a wrong step. If you take a step, in a direction that you're like, okay, this isn't for me, then you pivot and you take another step. It's like, it's just, you learn about yourself and and how to do business and then how to say your prices and how to accept money and Mm -hmm. how to, what labs to use that you like and how you want to sell it and what kind of service you want to provide. Like just do it, just try things. Nothing is wrong. Like I think people are always so scared that they're going to get something wrong. What is wrong? There is no wrong. Like nobody gives you a handbook of the perfect way to run your business because 
Ha- like we all, we're both portrait photographers and we run our businesses differently than each other, but it works for both of us. It's just finding your own way. So just, just do it. Mm-hmm. Just keep showing up, keep showing up, do the work, mm-hmm. do the work, yep. do the work, do the work. Yes, <laughs> yes, 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 yes. Awesome. Uh, last question. Where can people find you online, Carrie? Oh, yay. Um, okay. So Instagram and Facebook is at Carrie Roseman Studios. And my name is Carrie with a C, C A R R I E, uh, Roseman, R O S E M A N. Um, and yeah, so that's, uh, I'm on LinkedIn too, but I don't really hang out over there so much. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so it's pretty much Facebook and Instagram. And then I do have like a private VIP group called, um, it's like Carrie Roseman VIP Lounge. Cool. <laughs> so that's a fun one for people to yeah, join too. That's cool. for women though. That's women only. Okay. In there. Cool. Well, thank you again, Carrie. It was so good to chat with you. And hopefully I'll see you in person at some point soon. Yes. Some next fun. Portrait Masters, maybe. Hopefully. I don't know what the plans are, but oh. uh, I, yeah, I would absolutely love that. And thank you so much for reaching out. This is really great. And yeah. I loved talking with you, Nikki. Awesome. Thank you again. I will see you soon. All Yay. right.